Hello friends, I'm Jill Morricone. We are always delighted when you tune in every week as we explore the Word of God together on 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're in the middle of our journey through the three cosmic messages of Revelation chapter 14. This lesson, lesson number seven, is worshiping the Creator. I want to introduce to you my family on the set with me right now to my left, Professor Daniel Perrin. It's a privilege and joy to have you and I so appreciate your insights into the Word of God in Sabbath School. Thank you very much. I love to be here. And uh, my lesson is Monday's lesson, Worship the Creator. Amen. Pastor John Denzi, always glad to have you on. It's a blessing to be here. I've enjoyed these lessons. Wonderful. And I have Tuesday, a God who is close. Amen. Pastor Ryan Day, always love it to hear your insights, brother. Amen. Always a blessing to be a part of the Sabbath School panel. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Gospel Judgment Creation. Mm. Last but not least, Pastor James Rafferty, delighted to have you here. Good to be here, Jill. I have Thursday's lesson, which is entitled The Creator on the Cross. Mm. Amen. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And Pastor James, would you pray for us? Yes. Father, I just want to thank you for these three cosmic messages. Thank you for the quarterly and all the insights that we are gaining and sharing with our viewers. We just pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide and direct our hearts to Jesus. Help us to see him in the midst of these messages as the essence of the everlasting gospel. Yes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've been with us week to week, you know that we have studied already the everlasting gospel in Revelation 14, verse 6. And we've spent a couple weeks on fear God and give glory to Him and the hour of His judgment has come. Now we step into one of my favorite portions of the three angels' messages, the first angel's message, which is worshiping the Creator. As humans, we often take our very existence for granted, do we not? There's a philosophical question that sometimes people ask themselves. How do we exist? How can there be something from nothing? How could that have even happened? How did the world evolve? Or if it did not evolve and there was a creator God, how could something exist where there was nothing before? Something exists because in the beginning, Genesis 1, verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. That word created in the Hebrew, I love it, bara. It means something that God made out of nothing. And it's always used when God is the one God is the subject. God is the one doing the creating. In other words, there was nothing and God created something. There was darkness. God created light. There wasn't any vegetation or plants or animals or water or fish or anything. God created bara, something out of nothing. In the beginning, God, in contrast to atheism, created in contrast to evolution, created alone in contrast to polytheism. God rules over creation in contrast to pantheism. Matter had a beginning as opposed to materialism. And the ultimate reality is God as opposed to humanity. Hmm. The first angel's message in Revelation 14, verse 7. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. This, we're going to spend two weeks on this concept of worshiping the creator. This week we focus on worship God as creator. Next week we talk more about the Sabbath and creation and the Sabbath and eternal rest. Our memory text is found in Revelation 4. Revelation 4 verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. On Sunday's lesson, we look at John the Apostle exiled to the island of Patmos. The title of Sunday's lesson is A Companion in Tribulation. But before we get to that, I want to talk for just a moment about worship. If we're talking about worship the creator, the central issue in the book of Revelation is worship. The central issue in the great controversy is worship. Even the central issue in the battle in heaven, 
between Michael, Christ, and the angels, and Satan, or the dragon, and his angels, was over whose way was right. Mm -hmm. And loyalty to God, or loyalty to Satan, and his deceptions and his lies against God. The same thing we see with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The same thing with Cain and Abel. It was about worship, was it not? The, the, their own works, which was Cain with the fruit, or faith in the coming Messiah, which was Abel with the sacrifice of the lamb. Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. The issue was worship. The three Hebrews on the plain of Dora. The issue was worship. Would they bow down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up? Or would they stand true in their allegiance to the creator God? The second temptation of Jesus was over worship, was it not? Mm -hmm. To bow down to Satan and worship. In fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, verse 8, you shall worship the Lord your God. He's speaking in response or rebuttal to Satan. And him only you shall serve. In our day, I think of 1 John 2, verse 16. John says all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You see, today we choose to either worship Christ or to worship ourselves or to worship the things of the world. In the three angels' message, we see worship the creator, that's in the first message, or we believe we evolved. We see worship on Sabbath, or we worship on Sunday, the first day of the week. We see in the second angel's message, worship in Babylon, that false system of worship, or worship Christ and his truth, and as Revelation 18 says, come out of her, my people. In the third angel's message, we see worship the beast and his image on the false day of worship. Or worship Christ on the Sabbath that he sanctified and set apart and receive the seal of the living God. You see, it's all about worship. Worshiping Christ, though, is not always easy, is it? It goes against the natural tide. This is what John discovered, the apostle John discovered. He lived, of course, the longest of any of the apostles. He was not martyred early like many of the other ones were. The Roman Emperor Domitian had started that persecution of the Christians and John appeared before him and was sentenced to be put into boiling oil. We know that the Lord preserved his life and he did not die. And he was later exiled to the island of Patmos, which is off of modern day Turkey. This would have been 8095, and it would have been more than 60 years after the death of Christ. Patmos is a small rocky island, maybe 10 miles long, six miles wide, and prisoners and undesirable people were banished there. And John was banished to the island of Patmos, and there the Lord Jesus Christ showed up and gave him these visions. And we have the book of Revelation as a result. In Revelation 1, verse 9, John speaking, he says, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The takeaway I see in that verse is that a righteous life will bring about persecution. We know Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you jump back just a couple of verses to Revelation 1 verse 1, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. There is a purpose in your life and in mine in trial and persecution. David wrote many of the Psalms while he was being hunted and pursued by Saul. Mm. Isaiah lived during difficult times and died a martyr's death. Ezekiel wrote in exile. Jeremiah's life was one of trial and persecution. Paul wrote some of his epistles from prison. John wrote from exile on the island of Patmos. And yet there was a purpose in the midst of that trial and persecution. I don't know if we're gonna to get to all of them, but I had six purposes of persecution and trial 
in the life of a Christian. We say, what is the purpose of persecution? What is the purpose of trial? Purpose number one is to develop righteousness in the soul. Mm. Hebrews 12, verse 11. This is not a verse I like very much. Now, no chastening, chastisement, for the present seems joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it works the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. What does that mean? Trials develop in me the fruit of the Spirit, and the righteousness of Christ is developed more fully under trial and persecution. Purpose number two of persecution and trial is to learn the word of God. Mm. Psalm 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I've been afflicted. Wait a minute, it's good? I don't rejoice in trial. Seriously, God, it's good that I've been afflicted. Why? That I may learn your statutes. You see, we can learn the word of God in a special way under times of persecution and trial. Purpose number three is to teach us to rely on God, not ourselves. This is Paul talking in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure. Do you feel burdened beyond measure? Have you experienced trials and persecution beyond measure, above strength so that we despaired of life? Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Why? That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Trials and persecution teach us to rely on God, not ourselves. Purpose number four, trials help us grow in patience. James 1 verse 3, knowing this, that the testing or the trials of your faith produces patience. Trials develop patience in the life of the Christian. Number five, trials develop character in the life of the Christian. Romans 5, 3, and 4. Not only this, we glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, remaining under pressure. Perseverance produces what? Character. Mm -hmm. And character hope the purpose of trials is to develop character. And finally, number six, the purpose of trials and persecution is to enable you and I to bless and encourage someone else. This is Paul again, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, our persecution, in our time of trial. Why? So that we can comfort someone else who is in trouble by the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. So when we're walking through persecutions and trial, it can be a difficult time, but in the midst of that, God can have an overarching purpose in our life. Thank you, Jill. That was a good lesson. And I am Daniel Perrin, and I have Monday's lesson, Worship the Creator. And the lesson begins with these words. It says, Revelation 14, 7, ends with a clarion call to worship the Creator. I have to admit that uh, I had to go to a dictionary to look up what a clarion call is. A clarion is a shrill war trumpet from the Latin word clear. In other words, it is an instrument that is blown to summon people to the battle to let them know, to know where the point of conflict is. And is there a conflict? Is there some sort of battle around creation? Wouldn't we expect with God's word and scripture being so clear from the very first verse, very first word, that we as Christians would be united around this one teaching that God is our creator. But God predicted through the apostle Paul to Timothy that this day would come. In that letter to Timothy, uh, a young pastor encouraging him when trials were coming. Chapter 1, verse 4 of 1 Timothy says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, mm -hmm. and that's where we are right now, yep. some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Mm -hmm. So this is talking about Christians who take the truths of God's word and set them aside. Skipping now to 2 Timothy, here even more. 
chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up, up for themselves teachers and turn their ears away from the, te the truth and be turned aside to fables. And so we know through scripture that this experience at this time is coming when there would be a great challenge to God's authority and God's word. Uh, Peter said the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. They willfully forget, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Well, they willfully forget because the same God who created is also the God who gives us a law and it's a law of love and hearts hardened by sin and selfishness is that sometimes ours that we want to reject a lawgiver and want to do things our way. And so the enemy, he begins to attack the faith of God and he attacks the foundation the very foundation where it all starts because if you can destroy a foundation, everything else is going to crumble. And you can take any teaching of the Bible, absolutely any one of them, and they all trace their origin back to God as creator. We as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't have a written creed. We believe in the whole word of God. That's what we believe. And yet we express that through 28 statements about what the, what the Bible teaches. And you can walk through any one of those 28 statements and every one of them, if God did not create, then that one could not be true. And so our enemy knows if we can detract people's mind from God as creator, the whole story of salvation that you and I uh, find a blessing to our lives and eternal life falls underneath it. Uh, let's just take one of those, though. I want to read to you Isaiah 45, verse 12. I've made the earth and created man on it. Yeah. That is God's own word. That is God's own words. That is his testimony. I've made the earth and created man on it. Well, if God did not create the earth and make man on it, then what is this statement? <laughs> it's a lie. It's dishonesty of the highest degree. Uh, if we do not accept God as creator, then we take the entire word of God and we set it aside and we put something else in its place. God said this, but I think this. <laughs> and, and so in Exodus 20, verse 11, we find this. In six days, the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. If God did not create... Well, he certainly didn't rest at the end of his creation. And so when we place human opinion above the word of God, we deny God's word, we deny his wisdom, we reject his authority, we set him aside as Lord of our lives, and to be Lord is the one to whom we offer obedience. So 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 says, When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is the truth, the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. If we deny the word of God, we deny the work of God, his power to work in us. Creation establishes it all. When we deny creation, we also deny the attributes of God that are worthy of praise. From the very first verse of the Bible, we're introduced to an all-powerful God who by his word creates. He begins creation. He continues it. He's the one who says it's complete. He's the one who assigns everything its place. It's, he is the center, not the universe. The earth is not the center. God is the center. He is preexistent. He's before creation. He enters it only by his will. He's creative and he's giving and he is intricate. There's no detail too small for God to care about. And he is all wise. Now the, the lesson goes big. It goes with the sun, but we, we could also go small. We could go into every cell and the mitochondria and the Krebs cycle within there, the rods and cones in your eyes and every strand of double helix DNA and those four molecules of proteins and the ribosomes. And I can't tell you all about it, but everything is going to illustrate who God is.
But let's go to the sun for just a minute because that's where the lesson took us. Uh, the sun is the closest thing we find in scripture to a, uh, sorry, in, in nature to a perfect sphere. It's white because it emits all colors. You enjoy looking at color? All of that comes from the sun. 11 million degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. But if you take something from the center, the plasma, 27 million degrees, just enough to cover the head of a pin and set it a mile away, it'll still emit enough radiation to kill me. There's uh, the, the sun is the engine which causes photosynthesis. Every green thing that grows, in other words, all energy that is consumed comes from the sun and half of the oxygen of the earth is produced by plant life in the oceans because of photosynthesis from the sun. You enjoy a, a fresh breeze upon your face. Every bit of wind is caused by the sun. Clouds in the sky, all caused by evaporation from the sun. Every river, every bit of rain, every river ecosystem, all caused by the sun. You love the northern lights, the southern lights, all of that. Sun's charged particles. Do you like moonlight? That's just sunlight reflected, all right. <laughs> vitamin D, serotonin. And what I'm trying to say here is that we take all of this for granted, yeah. but you look at this thing and some people then turn and worship the thing, the yeah. sun, all right? But it is God who holds it in his hands. Yeah. And this is all out of my reach. This is too much for me to be able to control, but there's nothing too big for God. Listen yeah. to this, Matthew 5, 45. He makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He gives his blessing even to those who don't deserve it, even to those who, don't, who reject it. Psalm 148, verse 8, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. All of creation is in obedience to the will of God, illustrating to us a life that is lived, saying, Lord, you're the one who created, you're the one who provides. Psalm 147, verse 4, he counts the number of the stars and he calls them all by my name. We've assigned some names, some weird ones. RX 36. <laughs> God is way more creative than that. And each one he knows and cares about. But the, the amazing thing is that the God who knows the stars also knows me. Yeah. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And this is why we say, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Because it's not enough for us just to say, oh, Okay, I accept that God is creator. This is where we say, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Yes. This is Psalm 96, verse six. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. What does that mean? He cares for us. The God who holds the stars in place, the God who uh, created that sun, which gives you all those wonderful things. That God cares for you and it's our privilege. It's our honor to worship him. Revelation 5 verse 11. This wonderful book reveals to us what goes on in heaven. And here's what's going on in heaven in God's dwelling, uh, the four living creatures and the 24 elders worshiping constantly with these words, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. It's not enough for us just to know about the creator. We offer ourselves in worship saying, you are the leader, you are the Lord, you are the one I trust with my life. Amen. Thank you so much, Daniel. I was just thinking as you were teaching, you're an excellent teacher. And I was thinking as you were teaching, what a blessing at 3ABN that we have Daniel here. He taught high school Bible for years and years and years. And now he's here teaching you at home and teaching us. So thank you. And we're glad the rest of you are here too. I just, <laughs> <laughs> we're very grateful. I was just thinking because Daniel's the newest member of the That's team. Right. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. 
Welcome back to our study on worshiping the Creator, and we pass it over to John Denzi in Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much. Tuesday's lesson is a God who is close. And this is a message in itself, a God who is close. And so the lesson brings out that God is our creator. He created the sun, the moon, as you heard in the marvelous message by uh, Daniel Perrin a moment ago. He is our creator. He is such a marvelous God. He cares about each and every one of us. And Pastor Mark Finley brings out in the lesson, the same God who unleashed his infinite power to create the universe unleashes that infinite power to defeat the forces of evil that wage the battles for our souls. We are talking about the three angels' messages in Revelation chapter 14. And this is part of that message, understanding that God is our creator. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, there's talk about another creation. And it says there in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is a message that needs to be proclaimed and 3 Even has been proclaiming it. And it's a message of hope for each and every one of us. We all have a past that is marked with sin, a past that we don't want other people to look at. But God says, I will make you a new creation. All things have passed away. All things become new. He gives you a new beginning, Amen. and we praise the Lord for that. He continues to create in us, if we ask him. Remember, David said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You can ask him to do, to do that right now for you. How is your life? If you examine yourself and you see there is sin in you, the Creator can create in you a new heart and give you a right spirit. In the book, uh, devotional book, be, uh, to, be, to Be Like Jesus, page 356, it says, when Jesus speaks of the new heart, he means the mind, the life, the whole being. To have a change of heart is to withdraw the affections from the world and fasten them upon Christ. To have a new heart is to have a new mind, new purposes, new motives. What is the sign of a new heart? a changed life. There is daily, hourly dying to selfishness and pride. That's what God wants to do for us. If you want a new heart, He will give you new ways to think, new ways to do things. He will totally transform you and He will make all things new for you. What a wonderful God that is. This is a God that is close to each and every one of us. He's not far from any one of us. In Psalm 139, beginning in verse 15, we have, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they, they would not be, there will be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And so this is a marvelous God that we serve, our Creator. And in Acts chapter 17, verse 27, it says, So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him though He is not far from each one of us. He's not far. Mm -hmm. He is so near. As a matter of fact, He is standing near you right now. And He has His holy angels, and we understand that there's a guardian angel for each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. What a marvelous God. He's there to protect us. You know, if the devil had his way, you would have been destroyed long ago. Mm -hmm. But God limits him. No, you can only go this far. No, you can't do that. And so we see the evidence of that in, in Job chapter 1. Uh, the devil had tried to get to Job and uh, uh, he saw protection. He says, have you not set a hedge of protection about him? God is good and he's close to each and every one of us. Uh, in the lesson, uh, Pastor Mark Finley brings this out and I'd like to share it with you. Though the Lord dwells in a high and holy place, He is also with Him who has a contrite and humble spirit. That's in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. As Jesus Himself said, talking about His faithful followers, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, 
and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Mm -hmm. Wow, <laughs> did you catch that? Jesus is saying that you love them as much as you love me. You, the love of God for you is beyond any measure that you can come up with. There is no ruler long enough. There is no measuring stick long enough to measure God's infinite love for you. And this is something marvelous to consider. I remember Dr. Meshach Samuel, when he was in the area, he said something that caught my attention. He said, in India, there are millions of God. He didn't say how many, but I happened to look on the internet and found out there are over 33 million so-called gods of Hinduism. Uh, the Hindus worship many gods. And you know, I remember a time when we were uh, visiting the Indians, uh, Huichole Indians in Mexico. We were taken there by the second Seventh-day Adventist pastor that they've had in 50 years. And the only way you can get there uh, in a quick time is by a little plane. And this is the second Seventh-day Adventist pilot to go to these Huichola Indians. Wow. And uh, if you want to get there some other way, you will have to take a pickup truck and then there's only so far you can go. You have to stop and get on foot and walk for about another eight hours to get there. Mm -hmm. And as we were going through there, uh, I asked him, can I take video? He says, you can, but you have to be very careful because they don't want to be videotaped. So I was walking with the video camera, being respectful. And uh, as I was pointing the camera in a certain direction, like if you're walking with it, he says, be careful. Do not point the camera to that, to that bush. I, to that bush? He said, <laughs> I said, well, why not? He says, that is one of their gods. Mm. And I said, you know, this is remarkable that somehow uh, the devil has confused people and they make a God out of anything. Uh, you know, we think of today that there are no pagans, but there are still people worshiping false gods and statues. And uh, Pastor Meshach, uh, Dr. Meshach Samuel said something, and this is what he caught my attention. He said, they have all these gods, but there's not this concept that we are his children, or that we are children and that God loves us. And I was so glad to find out that God loves me and that I am one of his children. Isn't that marvelous? You can be a child of God. You can choose to become a child of God. And God is very close. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 10 tells you a little bit about how close that is. It says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Beside, besides God there is no Savior. There is no other God, only one Creator God, and Him we should serve. He is worthy of our worship. The verse that I was mentioning earlier about how close God is, is really Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. God does not forget you. You've heard that, uh, you know, that every one of us has a fingerprint like no one else has. Mm -hmm. You are an individual. There is no one like you. God created you unique and He loves you uniquely just the way you are. And it continues in Isaiah 49, see I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. It's like your name is on His hand. You are on His mind. God loves you. And this is why I want to bring this to you from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Consider, we, we go from being enemies of God to being children of God. Right. And this is why John invites us to behold that love. It is a love that is beyond our comprehension. It is not a passing glance to behold this love, it's to stop and consider, wow, God loves me 
more than I could possibly understand. And he's not only near us, he wants to be in us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Allow Christ in and you will have the hope of glory. Thank you so much, Pastor Dinsey, for that beautiful explanation. Um, my name is Ryan Day, and I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Gospel Judgment Creation. And uh, the lesson brings out, uh, I love the way he puts it here. He says, look at the first angel's message. Everlasting gospel, hour of judgment, worship the creator. Look at how closely related these ideas are. When we stand before the creator in judgment, it's only the gospel that gives us any hope at all. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. No condemnation now and certainly not in the judgment. The message of God as creator is so central to present truth, especially when evolution, even when dressed up in Christian garb, threatens to destroy the entire foundation of the Christian faith. Yet amid the onslaught of evolutionary thought, God has raised up a church, a people whose very name itself is a witness against the idea of evolution, a people who are to proclaim the foundational truth of God as our creator and redeemer. And it is certainly true that this evolutionary theory has dominated our current society, our modern world. Uh, and, and you expect the secular, non-believing world to believe in such things like this. But when you get inside the Christian church and you start to realize that these ideas and these perspectives and these beliefs uh, of evolutionary theory are being embraced by professed Christians, brothers and sisters who profess to believe in the Creator God. It's quite interesting. In fact, when I was studying this out, I couldn't help but think of the, the text found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 through 21, when Paul tells Timothy, he says, Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Now, that's that's the words in the New King James Version. Of course, if you read the King James Version, he says, uh, and oppositions of science falsely so called. And I just thought of that because I know that there's some disagreement among the theological uh, scholarly world as to what this means. But my mind went to that. And in, in fact, we know that it is for sure evolutionary theory is, is science falsely so called in the sense that it is destroying and very much uh, trying to break down the very foundation of God as creator. And as Brother Daniel Perrin brought out so clearly, once you destroy uh, the belief that God is creator, then all of the other beliefs, the very foundation of Christianity itself and the very foundation of our relationship between us and God begins to crumble as well. Of course, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9, Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 through 17, Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, Romans uh, chapter 5 verses 17 through 19, all of these establish a powerful truth and that is the very foundational truth and what we as Bible believing Christians should rest in, in foundation our faith on and that is that God is creator and he is absolutely redeemer and without him being creator he certainly cannot be our redeemer Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 says and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through whom Jesus Christ. I love that. That while the Godhead all was in, involved in creation, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, was the one actively speaking the words, let there be light. There was light. Let there be a mountain over there. There was a mountain. Let there be some people here. He breathed into their nostrils the breath of life, as the Bible says, and man became a living soul. Christ is our Redeemer. He is our Creator. Colossians 1 verses 13 through 17 also uh, helps reiterate the same truth. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, Redeemer, mm -hmm. and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. This is speaking of Christ, but then notice how it connects the redeeming aspect to His creative work. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. I almost said coexist. 
<laughs> but Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, of course, why should we worship God? Why does he deserve our worship? When the first angel's message says to worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, Revelation 4, 11 tells us, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. You know, I go back to the story of Job, my wife and I, recently uh, with a fine tooth comb went through and read through the book of Job together. And, uh, you know, I'm just always just amazed uh, by reading those first couple of chapters of Job because it, it just baffles me. It reminds me of Satan's power, his, uh, his, his soul, authority, his goal to try to distort God in our minds. And it's quite interesting that when you read the first couple of chapters of Job, he does exactly that by implying an accusation against God. And here's the reality. As I read those chapters, I, I'm sad in my heart because many people, People only worship God for the very reasons that the devil says that God is being worshipped. Mm. In other words, he implies, he says, oh, no, 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 remove your hedge of protection from Job. Take away all of the goodies that you've given him and he will curse you to your face. In other words, the implied accusation there that you, God, in and of yourself are not worthy mm. to be worshipped. And I, my heart breaks because I ask the, myself the question, how many people, when the, the trials come, the tribulations come, the bills may not get paid, I don't know, or, or, or some shaking uh, incident happens in their life where, you know, the clouds are hanging low and the darkness is, they're having to walk through that darkness or that time of despair. They, they, they tend to, uh, you know, lose their faith in God and they wonder, God, why me? But yet if the birds are chirping and the dogs are barking and the sun is shining and the bills are getting paid and the money's in the bank and the lights are on and the food's there and you got a nice car to drive and a nice home to live in and all the goodies are there and everything just seems to be going fine and dandy in your life. Oh, God is then worthy to be worship. God wants to know, will you worship me just because? Because I am the creator of the universe. You know, I don't have time to read this, but we see that the devil has always tried to attack. One of his central uh, areas of attack has always been on the creative power of God, mm -hmm. the creative works, the creative reality of God as creator of the universe. You can read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. I encourage you to find that book. Find that just in the very first chapter, page 36, where it talks about how Satan uh, in Lucifer at this time when he was in heaven, one of, the, one of the main things that sparked his rebellion or kind of you know, just launched him into this rebellion was that he was jealous of the fact that the Father you know, brought Jesus Christ the Son close to him and shared with him the plans of creation and did not include him. We also read this in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 36. That should be easy to remember. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36, and Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 36. Uh, both tell the story of how Satan hates Jesus Christ as creator. He hates the Father because of their creative work because it reminds him that they did not include him in this creative work of which he could not have done because he's not God. He's not divine. He is not the son of God. The, uh, the lesson goes on to say, look at how closely tied Jesus as creator is to Jesus as redeemer. And we see this all the way through the Bible as we saw in Colossians 1 a few moments ago. But I found some startling statistics. I'm going to try to share this in the last couple of minutes that I have. This is just showing you just how much the devil is, is, is taking time to attack God's, God's identity as creator of the universe. You know, expect the secular world to have these particular thoughts, but the Christian world? This is a Gallup survey that was done a few years ago in 2019. Uh, some people might consider it dated, but it was, the, it was the only one that I could find that was most recent. But this comes from Washington, D.C., and it says 40%, and this is all, this is Christians and non-believers, 40% of the U.S. adults ascribe to a strictly crea creationist view of human origins. In other words, a biblical view of creationism. Uh, and then it goes on to say, believing that God created them in their present form within roughly the past 10,000 years. Mm. However, more Americans continue to think that humans evolve over millions of years, either with God's guidance, 33%, you know, God helped with evolution or God had nothing to do with it. In other words, we were fully developed through evolution, uh, the 22%. Now that's Americans in general. But when you look within this study that they did, they isolated the religious groups and they looked at the statistics among Christians. Get this, this is the, this Protestants, 56, only 56% of Protestants who took this, this, uh, this survey believed the biblical belief that only God, God is responsible for our creation, period, end of story. Um, 33 
3% said, well, we, we, were, we evolve. Evolution is the reason why we come about, but God helped guide it along. And then 6%, small number, but again, 6% of Protestants say God had nothing to do with creation at all. It's, uh, it was all evolution. And then you get into Catholicism and the numbers are very, quite interesting. But then you look among the college degrees. Those who had no college degree, 48% believed the biblical model, while 30% of those with no college degree believed God gave a little bit of guidance and 16% God had nothing to do with it at all. But then you look at the co those with college degrees, and this is what was shocking to me. Not really shocking, but I found it interesting. Only 23% of those with college degrees said God is responsible for it all. Mm. Wow. 40% said God helped with evolution. And 33% of those with college degrees said God had nothing to do with it. It's powerful statistics, my friend. If you don't think the devil's attacking God as creator, then look again. Notice what the Bible says, worship him who created all things. Amen, amen. My name is James Raffrey and I have Thursday's lesson, which is entitled, The Creator on the Cross. The Creator on the Cross. Uh, the lesson starts out, by saying this, however much we can and do marvel and worship the Lord as our creator, there is more to it. As we have already seen, but worth looking at again, is the idea that our creator is also our redeemer. The God who created us is the same God who redeemed us. The God who said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, Genesis 1:26, is the same one who on the cross cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 46. Talk about the reason to fear God, or even more so, to give glory to Him, to worship Him as well. The author goes on to say, how can we as fallen human beings adequately respond to such an amazing truth as this? What could we possibly do in response? We are told in the first angel's message what to do. Fear God. Give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the springs or fountains of water. You know, this message in Revelation chapter 14, entitled The Everlasting Gospel, seems out of place because when you look at the book of Revelation as a whole, a lot of people think, oh, gloom and doom and judgments and plagues and beasts and dragons and oh, what's the everlasting gospel doing in that book? <laughs> Why is it there? That's what I used to think when I first actually started studying the Bible. I wondered about, you know, the, these earthly powers coming together, religion, church and state and uh, forming an alliance to enforce the mark of the beast and, and to force everyone to buy or sell, otherwise or force everyone to receive the mark in the hand of the forehead or they can't buy or sell. And, and in the context of that, you've got these, these group of people who are following Jesus and they're, you know, they're without fault and, and they give this everlasting gospel message and it just seemed like popping out in the middle of nowhere, like in, in, uh, 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 in the desert, like a, an oasis in the desert. And as I continue to study this message, I started to realize, you know, the book of Revelation isn't actually separated from the rest of the Bible. Mm -hmm. In fact, the book of Revelation is actually a summation of the entire Bible. And in the book of Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. And so when you go to the book of Revelation, you actually have to, in order to understand it, you have to go back to the rest of the Bible. A lot of it is in code, a lot of it is in symbol. But there's a lot of thoughts in the book of Revelation that are almost directly mm -hmm. from the rest of the Bible. For example, the three angels' messages. Let's take a look at that in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 23. Really interesting parallelism here in Luke chapter 23. You know, when you start out in Luke chapter 23, you have this church-state unity. In verse 1, the whole multitude of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, the ruling class who were out to crucify Christ, the whole multitude led him to Pilate, right? So right there in Luke chapter 23 and verse 1, you have this uniting of church and state. In fact, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 12, Herod, who's supposedly the head of the, of the uh, Hebrew Jewish nation and Pilate unite together in their purpose to crucify Christ. So right here, you've got that very same concept that's found in Revelation chapter 13 of the uniting of church and state. Now, when you go a little bit further in here, it's really interesting because once they bring Jesus to Pilate, do you know what Pilate says about Jesus? I find no fault in him. Mm. 
Now that reminds us of Revelation chapter 14, a people who follow the lamb wherever he goes, who are faultless, mm -hmm. who have no fault. They stand without fault before the throne of God. Now that doesn't mean that they're, gonna, they're going to stand without fault before the world. The world is going to find plenty of fault with those who give the everlasting gospel, right. just like the world, church and state, found plenty of fault with Jesus Christ when he was brought there to his cruel trial. But what about the everlasting gospel itself? You think about Jesus hanging on the cross and you realize he is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Jesus hanging on the cross is the gospel. And notice what he says as you look here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. We know this verse really well as Christians, but there may be some listening here who aren't. As church and state unites, as religious people and political people come together to crucify Jesus, he looks down upon them as they are putting nails in his hands and feet, as they are lifting him up on the cross, as they are mocking him. He looks down on them. He lifts his head to the Father and he says, Father, forgive them mm -hmm. for they know not what they do. Yeah. That is the everlasting gospel. That is the everlasting gospel. It's a beautiful picture if you think about it because Revelation is simply duplicating what has already taken place in the context of the cross of Calvary. But there's more, there's much more. When you look in Luke chapter 23 and verse 38, you can parallel that with this phrase in Revelation 14 that the gospel is supposed to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Because in Luke chapter 23 and verse 38, it says that when Jesus was lifted on the cross, a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, of Latin, and of Hebrew. And you know why? Because they wanted all the world mm -hmm. to be able to read about this man who yeah. claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. So you've got that same parallel there. And then you go a little further here and you find in Luke chapter 23 and verse 46, Luke 23, verse 46. And when Jesus cried with a loud, loud voice, well, that's the way the third angel's message is given. It's given with a loud cry. It's given with a loud voice. So you have Jesus here paving the way for the three angels' messages. Mm -hmm. the, the, the center of the three angels' messages is found in the cross of Calvary. In fact, look here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 40. There's these thieves that are hanging next to Jesus, one on the left and one on the right. And as they begin to behold Christ and behold his mannerisms, his spirit, his attitude, the way he relates to all of this. It says here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 40 that the one of the thieves answering the other thief who was mocking Christ rebuked him saying, dost not thou fear God? Mm. All of a sudden the cross of Christ has produced a godly fear <laughs> in one of the thieves that are hanging there next to Christ. See, this is what the gospel produces. You cannot have a clarion call to fear God and give glory to him unless you have the proclamation of the gospel yes. because it is the gospel that produces that fear. It is the gospel that causes us to give glory to God and to worship God. And this is what the Sabbath school lesson is bringing out so powerfully in relationship to the cross and Christ hanging upon the cross. Look at this one in Luke chapter 23 and verse 47. Luke 23 and verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what was done, in other words, he watched Christ, he saw everything that was taking place, what did he do? He glorified God. This is not a professed believer, it's not even a Jew. This is a hardened soldier, a hardened soldier. And what is he seeing? He's seeing the gospel. Mm -hmm. He's seen Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. He's seen the revelation of forgiveness to the entire world, even to those that are crucifying him. And it breaks his heart. He says, we need to give glory to, mm -hmm. to God. This is amazing. And then, and then the next phrase, now remember, all these phrases are found in Revelation 14. They're borrowed from the gospel. The next phrase is found in, in Luke 23, verse 43. I'm going to see if my panel, my guests here, uh, my fellows can, can pick out what's taking place here. It's the thief on the cross in verse 43. Jesus says unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, because he puts faith in Christ, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know what's just taking place right there? The judgment. Mm -hmm. The judgment. That thief has just been judged and he's going to be in paradise. Mm. God has made a judgment call on the thief and promised him, you're going to be with me in paradise. Fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come and worship him. That's exactly what we see taking place in verses, well, verse six. When Jesus died, they take his body off the cross. Verse 56, sorry. And then they return, they prepare spices, anointments, and they rest on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. And guess what commandment that was? 
<laughs> it was the fourth commandment. That's right. The fourth commandment is in the context of the cross. This is the everlasting gospel and it's producing a fear, a glory, a judgment, a worship of God who created heaven and earth. And then we've got the the uh, Babylon has fallen. Remember, the thief says this. The, the, the soldiers say this. The religious leaders say, save yourself, save yourself, save yourself. Well, Babylon is saying the same thing. But that all falls in the context of the cross of Calvary. Mm -hmm. He's not there to save himself. He's there to save us. And then there's a darkness over all the face of the earth. That's the wrath of God in Revelation chapter uh, 14, three angels' messages. We have the wrath of God. Jesus experienced that wrath. He was forsaken of God. And then you have this... Um, <coughs> Well, that's it. Oh, the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. Verse 46, Jesus dies and he says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Mm -hmm. Despite the feeling, despite the circumstances, despite what everything, everything that was happening all around him, Jesus Christ committed himself to the Father. He trusted in the Father. He trusted in, in his Father's love. He had faith that God would deliver him from all the circumstances that surround him. So the three angels' messages are not some unique message. Plunked into the book of Revelation, the three angels' messages is the everlasting gospel here, right here in the book of Luke and the gospels of Matthew and Mark and John. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James. I love that comparison. I'm going to study that more. Thank you. You're a fabulous teacher, each one of you. Thank you. Ryan, Pastor Johnny, and Daniel, thank you for sharing from the Word of God. I've learned so much today. I want to give each one of you a moment to share a final thought. Yes, all of creation, even in its deteriorated condition, still teaches about God. So as you are able, go outside. And in the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, look at the birds of the air, look at the flowers of the field, and worship your Creator. Mm -hmm. Amen. I take you back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, and it says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Jesus is pictured in Revelation 3.20, standing at the door and knocking. And if you open the door, he will come in. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Let him in. Amen. Mm -hmm. Someone told me one time not to wear my tie like this because they said it was an LGBTQ tie. But I'll tell you, it's not that. Just because it has the colors of the rainbow, I look at it as my creation tie. Jesus is creator. And when I look at it, it reminds me of his creative power. He controls the waters. He controls nature. He puts the rainbow in the sky. It's Jesus Christ who is creator. And we should worship him because of it. Mm -hmm. And one more parallel here in Luke chapter 23, verse 24. And Pilate gave sentence that, they should, that it should be as they required. In other words, he gave the death sentence to Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ took the death sentence upon himself so that we would not be heard of the second death. Amen. Thank you all so much for your study of the word. You are men of the word and of God and so grateful you're part of the 3ABN family. We're grateful that you are part of the 3ABN family as well. We hope you've enjoyed this study as we've discussed worshiping the creator. I want to close with a verse we've used several times this week, but I think it bears repeating. Revelation 411, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you create created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Join us next week, the Sabbath and the end.